Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the symposium. So happy to have you here with us on day three. Uh, I'm super excited for this panel. Um, it's the Coaching Skills and Apprenticeship panel. And I am joined by three very lovely ladies. I'm joined by Dominic Hajan, who is the Executive Director of Education with Dr. Sears Wellness and my friends. We're joined by Becky Bishop, and Becky's involved in the development of Dr. Sears' program, and she has been there from the beginning, pretty much, right? And uh, she's the education manager. And we're joined by Karen Dalton, who is the who is Doctor of Public Health and also an instructor at Dr. Sears Wellness. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So happy to have you here today, and. Um, we're gonna talk about a lot of important things and we also have a super exciting announcement that we're gonna make a little bit later um, in our panel. So just to get started, you know, we have most of our audience here are health coaches. What, Dominique, I guess this question is to you, uh, what sets Dr. Sears Wellness apart from, from other coaching schools? And we don't need to talk about others, we can just talk about what it is that makes your program so amazing? So the, obviously there's a lot of things that we think make it amazing, but we definitely are unique in this space. You know, we are very tuned into focusing on making successful health coaches qualified and successful health coaches. And so our training is really multifaceted. It covers all of the core concepts as far as lifestyle and exercise, attitude, nutrition, all of that. And then obviously, as we go into more in-depth training, our advanced training digs deeper into that behavior change side and focuses more on motivational interviewing and appreciative inquiry and all of those skills. Our training is definitely focused more on helping people practice the skills that they're going to be using out when they're a coach. And it's not just giving them book knowledge, it's giving them those practical skills that they need to be successful coaches once they graduate. And there's several other aspects of our training, I think, that really set us apart too. Some One of those is, is our ongoing support. So once our coaches graduate from our training, not only are they very, very skilled and very qualified, they have the support of our organization behind them after they graduate. So if they get a question or they have more an area that they need additional support and we're here to help uh, get them that support either internally, which we can offer to them through the Dr. Sears Wellness Institute, or we can direct them somewhere where they can get that information. So, um, but it's a very, um, very comprehensive training and very well done. And obviously, um, Dr. Sears names on the door. So uh, it was developed by a medical doctor. So it's a very scientifically based training. And so it's not just theory, it's the science behind effective um, coaching and all the different aspects that coaching um, has, which includes, you know, obviously the, the health side of it, but also the communication side of it. And then even things into stress management and sleep hygiene and things like that, that people don't really think about with coaching, but coaching is really the whole person. It's a very holistic approach to health and wellness. And so our training is very focused on that and allows our um, our graduates to be very successful and sought after health coaches, which has been a great experience. We're talking about those building blocks to happy and healthy humans, right? So got to take everything into consideration. And I love how you have that community aspect, which is such a huge part of what we do and having the people that you need to rely on to, to come back to, right? Um, so I love that. Um, what do you think are essential skills that a health and wellness coach should have? So I'm actually going to pass this over to Becky because I think she has a great way of explaining this. And since her role here at the Wellness Institute is very, um, very diverse. Um, so Becky, I'm going to throw that one to you. Absolutely. I'm happy to take it. We, we have such a diverse group of um, coaches come through, right, from so many different backgrounds. And so trying to find the skills that um, can marry whatever background they come from to be a successful coach is so important. And it really um, comes down to a genuine passion for helping others, but then also a willingness to um, kind of let go and realize that it's a partnership and that you're not in charge of where 
um, your client winds up, right? You're there as a good guide. So for us, it's very much about creating good guides and people who are compassionate, empathetic listeners. They listen with their entire being and um, are comfortable using silence and patience and allowing the client the space to grow. Um, so all of those things, um, when someone comes with that passion for helping others, sometimes it comes with a desire to point someone in one direction. And so for us, it's helping them get to the point where um, they realize that sometimes doing nothing and just listening is coaching. Coaching is so much more than telling someone what to do. And so being that compassionate person, empathetic, and having that unconditional positive regard for your client and allowing a client-centered practice so that the client is always kind of um, the one driving the boat and we're guiding them along the way. I think that's where we kind of land as a group on seeing um, there being um, common skills that everyone can develop and learn no matter what background they come to us with. So a couple of things to unpack here. You mentioned different backgrounds. Do you have to have any prior training before enrolling in a Dr. Sears program or can anybody just come in and do it? So, in, so we don't have a specific requirement because our training was written and developed by a medical doctor, it's pretty robust. So they're gonna learn everything they need to know to be an excellent health coach just by coming through our training. We do tend to attract a lot of medical professionals to our training. We have a lot of nurses, um, we have physicians, registered dietitians, even naturopaths, we have personal trainers. And then we have people who don't have any health and wellness background. But the beauty of the holistic focus of health and wellness is that anybody can come and, and they're all going to learn the same stuff. So medical professionals, unbeknownst to a lot of people, don't get this type of training in their schooling. And so they come to our training thinking, wow, I, I, you know, I might know some of this. And then they leave going, wow, I didn't know any of that because that wasn't something that was taught to them in their traditional school. And so our training is so comprehensive that it covers everything you need to know. And so technically you don't need any specific background. Um, it is a more rigorous training. So we do want to make sure that people are prepared for that um, coming into our training. It's not a cakewalk. Um, it is something that they're going to have to invest in. But when they do that, they're coming out just really qualified qualified coaches. I think that doctor in your name probably has something to do with attracting a lot of medical professionals. Yeah. Um, so Becky, you were saying that it's really being a guide and listening. So I find that's probably the hardest part of being a coach is not to, not telling people what to do, especially since people come to you asking what to do, right? Because that's that's what everybody wants. How do I fix it? And how do I fix it quick? And tell me you should, you should have all the answers. And this is what I hear from a lot of coaches who are just starting out. And also those who've been at it for a really long time. It's really hard to separate yourself and to become that guide and not to be the one with all the answers. How do you handle that when coaches come to you? Um, what issues like that? It's so true, right? Because and we teach early in our program, the difference between like the deficit approach to coaching and what we call the positive approach to coaching. Um, and that deficit mindset is honestly um, getting a coach to, to shift their mindset is the easy part. We often have to be prepared to, and we tell our coaches to be prepared that you have to train your client to shift from the deficit mindset because they come in and they think if they just, um, you know, tell you enough information <laughs> that suddenly yep. you can fix everything. And of course we know that that's not um, the path to sustained behavior change, right? Science tells us that having that positive approach and being a collaborative partner with your coach is what gets you to sustain behavior change. So a lot of times it's um, encouraging our coaches to trust in the process, to listen and understand what we're teaching and have confidence that it will work, even if it requires us 
to spend time in the early stages of coaching to shift our client's mindset away from the deficit approach to, I'm going to tell you everything that's wrong with me, now you fix it, to let's unpack what's working and let's discover why that's working for you in other areas and how can you take what's working for you and yep. apply it to the areas that you want to see growth. And that does require a shift, not just in mindset from the coach perspective, but also in the client perspective. There's been a lot of emphasis on good coaches, but we don't really talk about good clients because the client needs to be willing to invest. They need to be able to do the work and they need to be able to listen as well. So I find that it's it's definitely a two-way street. Um, have you had to fire any clients? Just any of you in your coaching? Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have have, have had clients yeah. that weren't the best fit yeah. <laughs> for coaching. Um, I personally haven't had to fire a client, but there are definitely those that require much more um, mindset shifting into it. And, and so progress tends to be slower. Um, I often say that for um, when we're training our coaches, that it's like uh, walking this constant tightrope of knowing that we honor our client's autonomy, but we yeah. also have to honor the science of behavior change. And somewhere in the middle is where we meet our clients, right? So we have to kind of um, sometimes direct in a guiding style so that we help um, structure our coaching sessions. And um, I like to say sometimes that we can be the neck and our clients are the head and yeah. our neck can turn our client's head in different directions to open up possibilities and getting them to consider things that they didn't consider before. And um, a lot of times that just takes more time. <laughs> so, time and patience time yeah and, patience. and again trusting in the process that it does work that you can guide someone to that mindset yeah a lot of coaches who are just starting out you know they graduate they're not really sure what to do and they just grab any clients that they can have anybody that is willing to work with them do you find that that's the best approach or should they be choosier and who they work with um, when they first start out Karen, how about you? What do you think? Um, well, I actually think that when we first start out with our clients, we really don't know what we're going to get, right? What we're going to see in our client. And in that regard, I think the coach has a responsibility to really work with that client, understand, do that dance with them, um, work around their issues that are there. And I think some clients that may be hesitant in the beginning or not the ideal client turn around and become that coachable person who really does have the idea of their best selves in mind and works towards that. So it is possible. So we, sh we shouldn't possible. just turn people away right off the bat, right? Give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Of course. I and love that's that. Really, that's really what the initial consultation is for, right? To make sure, see if it's a good fit, to make sure that there's, you know, that it's going to work. Absolutely. Two-way street all the way. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think is the best way to improve coaching skills? That's the question that is on everybody's mind. How can I be better? Because there's that mindset, right? That you're never good enough to, to coach. You're never good enough to that imposter syndrome, right? Everybody has it a little bit. So how do you feel is the best way to improve coaching skills? I think we'd all probably agree coach, <laughs> right? Practice. You, the better, the more you do it, just like any skill that we have, the more you do it, the better you get at, the more confident you get. And so that's the best way to do it. And figuring out what's going to, what platform is going to be the best for you as far as how to do that. Um, obviously you want to try to find real clients because that's an authentic experience versus 
Uh, you don't, you know, coaching other coaches doesn't always give you the, that experience that a real world coach would. That's why in our training, we actually ask our students to get real world clients, not, not to only coach each other, but to coach volunteers that are willing to be authentic and transparent with them in the coaching session so that they can experience things that may be unexpected, right? Because when when you've got it, when you're coaching another coach, they can kind of guide that a little bit with you. But when you're coaching a real client or somebody that's a volunteer for you, they're going to be authentic and real. And that's going to be the best experience uh, is to really practice, practice coaching on all levels. And I know Becky and Karen might have some insight in this too. I'd love to hear that. I couldn't agree more that the um, ability to put yourself in it's uncomfortable when you aren't quite sure you're ready to do it, right? Um, so Dominique, um, you know, mentioned that in our in our program, we have them actually coach volunteers so that they can at least get to the end and say, I put myself in the situation of not knowing what the other person is going to say or do, or that they have the same background as a coach as me. Um, so that's that's a powerful piece of our program. At the same time, um, making sure that you coach with a wide variety of people um, so that you get to experience different stages of change. I, um, you know, when we have our feedback sessions with our coaches at the end of the program, and often I'll say, you know, if you look at this in a different situation and consider this person being in contemplation, and not in action, would that have changed your coaching decisions? And they sit back sometimes and think, oh my gosh, they just weren't ready to change, <laughs> right? And so yeah, until, yeah. until you coach in a lot of different situations, um, you're not sure what tool to pull out of your toolkit. So by putting yourself with a wide variety of people that come to you at different stages of change and um, you can start to recognize different situations. And even though every client will be different in front of you, the stages of change will start to repeat themselves. And so the strategies you pull out can work regardless of the who the person is. And the only way you can get to that point to recognize those different stages of change and connect your strategies to the stages is to put yourself in enough situations that you see a wide variety of um, stages of change. And not only that, to coach with the same person for a long period of time, even if they're a volunteer. Because in the early stages of the coaching program, you do very different things than you do in the later stage. So when you coach someone three times, that's great, but you're never gonna get past the early stage. Whereas if you coach someone 12 times or 15 times, suddenly you're gonna see motivation wax and wane. You're gonna see someone in action have a setback and circle back to contemplation. And without having that length of time with the same person, you might miss some of those experiences. So coach a lot of different people and then coach a few people a long time, I guess. <laughs> that makes sense. You mentioned feedback. Do you find that feedback is an important part of the process as well? It's critical part of the process for both coach and clients, I think. Yeah, totally agreed. Karen, what do you think? Anything to add? To yeah, what, uh, so you said, yep. I'll just add to that a little bit. Um, Becky brought up, you know, your toolkit and having these tools that you use. And I think that the, the larger variety of people that you work with gives you an opportunity to pull those different tools out. And some coaches want to know, like, am I using the right tools or am I, am I hitting the nail on the head with the direction I'm going? And that's all about trial and correction, right? That you'll know when you build that trust and that uh, relationship with your clients, whether the tools you're using are the ones that launch them towards that behavior change. So being able to, um, you know, keep your toolkit full and use those tools often, I think is really key. I like how you call it trial and correction and not trial and error. <laughs> I love that. It's really great. 
Um, so I know that mentorship is an important aspect of what you do at Dr. Sears. Um, and it's absolutely, I believe it's an important aspect of what we all do in life, not just coaching. Um, what is a mentor to you? How big of, what, what part does it play in your, in your training and your education that you provide? So it's a huge, it's a huge yeah. part, <laughs> right? Um, because, and again, it's that, it's that practice and then, and then having someone else who's a little more experienced uh, help like observe and guide. And, you know, when you're, when you're in our training, we have, I think it's 13 sessions where they have to coach other people. And so it gives them multiple opportunity to experience um, all of that. And so when they're they're going through it, they're mentoring, they're, they're kind of actually self-evaluating themselves because they have to videotape what their, their session, they watch their session on the videotape and then kind of write a self-reflection on it to, to start identifying what happened in the session, not only with themselves, their, their tone, the questions they ask, how their eye contact was, what their body language was saying, and then also observing their client kind of now from the outside in where they're not sitting in front of their client anymore, but sometimes they're not as observant, but now they're watching the videotape to, to see what their client was doing and being able to get the skill of self-evaluating, right? Um, and then obviously the instructor is gonna evaluate them as well and coach them through the process as far as this is this is what I noticed. And just being able to dialogue, we've learned and Becky and I and, and Karen and I actually have all talked about this, that the, the better that a coach can be at self-evaluating and that the better the coach they're gonna be down the road because they're always gonna be trying to improve and get better at it. But then of course the instructor is, is mentoring them throughout the process as well to give them outside feedback. And so mentoring is a huge part of growth as a coach. And uh, I think Becky, you had another comment you wanted to make on this too when we were talking earlier. On the, um, the being able to um, connect coach and client and um, how, um, well, we, we often talk about um, the, the, when people get out, we want them to be confident that they can step into this role, right? And it's a strong program and they should feel confident, um, right? That, and they've had this mentoring. And then at the same time, we have people that are perfectionist and they are saying, um, gosh, I'm not ready yet. I, if I could just get three more certificates, I'll be yes. ready. <laughs> and so we were talking about how um, really if they would take that sort of um, investment into instead of other trainings, invest into a mentor um, type situation that kind of bridged the gap and got them into what we were just talking about. The, we talk about um, we want our clients to be in the flow of life right? And, and have a balance of skill and challenge when they set their goals. And we were thinking the same thing about um, our coaches. We want them to be in the flow of coaching so that they feel confident because when they're confident, they're going to feel more happy and secure as coaches and they're going to enjoy it more. So um, a mentor can really bridge the gap between I have the skills I need I have the knowledge and now I need to have the confidence that I'm applying them correctly. And that, that mentorship um, investment really can help you get to that next stage to where you're ready to jump in and not only just jump in, but feel confident that you've um, got a partner in the process that can help you make sure you're making um, good coaching choices. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I think just to tap on that is a mentor when if, if a, a mentor and is watching a session right there and then they have a meeting with the, um, the coach that they're working with afterwards they can affirm what they did well like I really noticed that 
the skills that you use with this client really help that client move forward. You could tell it by the client's body language or what they said afterwards and just kind of drawing attention to what went well, that's going to build their confidence. And hopefully the coach is also recognizing in the client that the client's nodding or saying, wow, that really helped me. I never thought of it that way. Those are all things that are going to build confidence, right? So there's, there's a multitude of things that are going to help build confidence, which I agree, Becky, is one of the the things that people struggle with. And the best way to build confidence is to get out there and coach and get feedback from both your client and possibly a mentor to help you build your coaching confidence. It seems like there's some confusion when we talk about mentorship, about um, coach mentorship and about a lot of people uh, think it's business mentorship, you know, that a mentor is going to tell you how to run your business. Let's talk a little bit about that. Um, do you see that as well? Do you find that there is a lot of confusion regarding it? Yeah, I think the term mentor is is kind of got a, a vague description. Um uh, mm-hmm. A lot of people say, well, I want to be mentored, but what they really meaning is I want to know how to launch my business, which that's different. That's business coaching, right? That's a different realm. And we help our coaches with that as well. But it is, it is different how you coach someone on a business side and how you coach someone to be better, a better coach are, are two very different things. And so, um, you know, and honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, coaches really need both, right? They need, they need both. On the business side, um, but they also need support on how to be a better coach. And so, but there is a difference and the term mentor does sometimes get convoluted a little bit where people think that when I say I want to be mentored, that I'm meaning business coaching, not actual improving my coaching skills. So let's define it here. Let's talk about what is it? What's a coach mentor? What is their scope of practice? Maybe a sample of what they would tell uh, their mentee right after after a session how would something like that go maybe like a little role play yeah karen you want to take this one okay so (laughs) i think the role of the mentor is really to create those transferable skills that go from the mentor who essentially has an expertise in the coaching process transfers it to the mentee who then can transfer it to their client And that does build like what everybody's been talking about here. It does build the confidence in that individual so that, you know, where they need that safety net below the tightrope, they've got someone that they can fall back on, that they can get that direction from what or or the guiding from, you know, what looked good, what could be improved on and having that open mind, it gives both the mentor and the mentee an opportunity to build that relationship, that trust. So that can be transferable all throughout the coaching process. So when it comes to scope of practice, I think the actual scope of practice for the mentor is to do that guiding, to make the coach the best coach they can be. Just as the coach is making the client, working with the client to be the best version of them themselves. I love it. Everybody needs to be a best version of themselves. That's, that's what our job here is, right? Happy and healthy humans and the best versions of themselves. So how would, what kind of feedback would you give after a coaching session? So let's say you're watching it and what is something that you would say um, to somebody that you're mentoring? So in working with a mentee, I would look for the tools that they used to guide their client. Um, And, you know, it's not going to be that directing role as well. It's really going to be heightening awareness. Um, What what stage of change did the individual, uh, did you find the individual in? Sometimes people find the stages of change to be a little, um, you know, blurry when they move from one stage to another and really falling back on that, what tools could be used at that moment and having the mentee really develop that think about it and come up with the, um, you know, what the possibilities could be, and then um, building upon those possibilities. I think that, you know, we just don't know how clients are going to change at what point that aha moment happens. So it's really about giving feedback to get to that point of creating the aha moments in change. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there's so many different coaching techniques. There's so many things that we can do as coaches to help guide our clients. How can a coach who is just starting out, how can they know? And is this something that a mentor can help them with? Um, 
to understand when to use what techniques. What do you think? Do you want to jump on this one? Because I think that there's some definite overlying here on the feedback sessions. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the, um, because there are so many different skills and tools, getting um, your, as a coach, being able to step back and think through, had I made a different decision, how might have this session unfolded differently? That doesn't mean that it, that it went poorly, right? It just mean, means that it could have gone different. Differently is not bad or good. It's just different. And so when we give ourselves the time and space to think about those other skills and tools and where that might have um, guided the, the conversation differently, we open ourselves up to what Karen said, trial and correction um, and being willing to experiment. We want our clients to experiment with their goal setting. And in the same way, when um, we work with a mentor that encourages us to step back and kind of view the coaching situation with a, um, a lens from above and, and consider the different paths that could have happened just in one session, the learning opportunity is um, infinite. And yeah. sometimes all we need is just another uh, pair of eyes and ears that has a little bit more experience than we do. Every profession benefits from mentorship and coaching is no, no different. When we can um, utilize the wisdom of someone that's gone before us, we can suddenly um, imagine, you know, we, we talk about our, our clients following, um, going, being at the top of a mountain and being a water body and they could go down any, sometimes they're going down a waterfall you know, that's rushing. And other times they're on one of those creeks that seems to be going back up the mountain. And we can be the same way as coaches. Um, we can kind of get stuck in a rut or we can get stuck and think um, the only way down is through the waterfall, right? And so when we um, use somebody else as a guide <laughs> to give us, uh, you know, let us open our eyes and see all the different ways the water might go down the mountain. Um, the opportunity for learning and growth is, like I said, infinite. The visuals, I'm enjoying the visuals. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I think we've been building up enough here. Um, we did promise a very exciting announcement. So uh, I think it's time to make that announcement. We, uh, we talked a lot about mentorship, um, and I think it's time to introduce the apprenticeship program that we are gonna be launching together with Dr. Sears Wellness. So it's gonna be your coach and Dr. Sears Wellness uh, apprenticeship program. And Karen is gonna be our first mentor coach in this program. So yay, we're super excited. Um, a little bit, you know, I'll set the stage about what this apprenticeship program is going to be. And uh, Dominique, you and I can talk a little bit more about it, um, how it came about. So, you know, here at Your Coach, we have thousands of coaches who are practicing on the platform, and we do talk to a lot of them. We have a fabulous community manager that, you know, has a lot of community events, and we, we have a lot of conversations. And the thing that just kept coming up a lot is, I graduated, what now? what do I do? And, you know, it's one thing we say you should coach, but it's hard to find the volunteers. And, you know, if somebody doesn't have skin in the game, if they're not paying you, they're not really vested so much in helping you freight hone your, your skills. Um, so coach, coaches are saying, what do we do? You know, they're getting, you know, to Becky's point, certification after certification. And if I get a couple more and I'll be better, right? That, that's infinite. You know, we have coaches on a platform who have dozens of certifications and have never coached a day in their lives. So we got to talking and we decided that it would be such a fabulous idea to come up with this apprenticeship program. So a mentor coach like Karen is going to come from Dr. Sears Wellness. And this coach uh, like Karen 
actually Karen, right, is uh, is really great at what she does and she's really great at mentoring and she's had a lot of experience. And coaches can apply to be apprentices from all walks of life. Uh, you could graduate any school and uh, you can come to us and you can let us know that you wanna be an apprentice and we will provide you with a client that you can mentor, uh, that you can coach. And uh, Karen is gonna be there as your mentor, helping you along the way and having those coaching sessions with you as your mentor to, uh, to help out. Did I explain that the right way? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. Yeah, I think, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about skills versus confidence, right? Most yeah. people who graduate from a quality program and have really invested in their learning are going to come away with a number of skills. But the confidence is something that takes some time to build. You know, sometimes they come out and we try to give them, like we said, that real world experience with volunteers throughout the training to help build that confidence right out of the gate. But you're right. There are still people out there who are just like, wow, I just, that's kind of, I'm just not good enough yet. Um, we yeah. We tend to attract a lot of perfectionists to, um, to our program where they just want to be perfect. Coaching, you'll never be perfect. You're always going to learn. You're always going to grow. And it's just a matter of giving you all the different experiences so that you can get all the textures of all the things that are happening to give you the different experiences you need to consistently um, grow your skills. And it is just like any other thing. The more you practice, the better you're going to get. And so a mentoring program gives you the safety net of knowing, okay, I'm not by myself. <laughs> um, there's someone else here. Not that the mentor coach would step in in the coaching process because it really needs to be between, between the coach and the client, but knowing that there's someone there who is kind of um, just kind of observing and taking notes yeah. after the session, the mentor yeah. and, the, and the apprentice will chat and the, and a lot of times it's, you know, you'll ask the, the coach, well, what did you think went well? What, what did you see that maybe could have done differently to help them kind of identify things that, um, that did go well, right? Building on the positive um, approach, helping them, yep, you're doing that well, let's keep doing that. And you can apply that same skill to a different area or here's an area, what's another tool that maybe you could have chosen in this um, situation. So it just gives them a great opportunity to, in kind of a comfort of knowing, okay, I'm not alone. Um, I'm doing this with someone, someone's here to support me in the process and then I'm gonna grow as a result. Yeah, um, I think in a lot of ways it's having that safety net. And I think in all aspects of life and not just coaching, when we feel we have that safety net, we are more encouraged. We we can go on and, you know, we're going to do a great job, right? Because we know that there's somebody who is there to catch and to give us advice. And um, so that's, uh, that, that's really exciting. Karen, I, I know you have something to say about this, so I would love to hear from you. <laughs> Well, I think what I have to say is that, um, you know, when approached with this idea that um, you and Dominique built, it was so exciting to me because it is, you know, coming from a background of being a doctor of public health, I really was missing something in the whole process of working with people. When I went through the program, I really felt like I had a good mentor behind me the whole time and felt like it's a gift that you can give other coaches that can just launch them into a new level of coaching. And so it just excites me throughout my whole body to be a part of this exciting, exciting project and partnership. And it excites us very much that you're on board and you know we've had some conversations and it's, um, it's, it's gonna be really great what we're building here. So this is just the beginning. Um, so, you know, if you feel that what you, if you're watching and you feel you, you have what it takes to be a mentor, please reach out to us, uh, talk to us. And if you feel that you're ready to be mentored and you want to be part of this apprenticeship program, again, reach out to us and, uh, you can reach out to us. It's a team at your coach.health and we'll be happy to guide you. You can also, um, reach out to, to Dominique, um, Dominique, do you want to give, um, information where they can reach you at? Sure. So yeah, so you can reach out to us at the doctorsearswellnessinstitute.org. There's a contact us form there. You can fill that out and um, just put, you know, I listen to the Your Coach um, talk on, on mentoring in the symposium and I'd like more information or I'd like to get involved. Um, just put that on there and then they can reach out. And you can also email me, um, Dominique at doctorsearswellness.org. 
Awesome. Yeah, so we're looking forward to hearing from you. We're looking forward to getting your feedback, your thoughts, because we're obviously really excited about it. And uh, I hope everybody watching is as excited as we are. Um, so I liked, you know, the, the theme of this year's event is building blocks to happy and healthy humans. So I would love to ask each one of you, what, what in your opinion makes a happy and healthy human? So Karen, let's start with you. Oh, that's such a great question. So what makes a healthy and happy human, I've said it before, is striving to be your best self that um, we never, we're never perfect. We're never, you know, there. And just having the awareness and the ability to strive for more is happiness and health. That's great. Love that. What do you think, Becky? What makes a happy and healthy human? So I, I think there's so, as many definitions as there are humans, right? For what yep. makes a happy, healthy human. So I kind of have to take it from my perspective. And I mentioned earlier, the flow um, of life is when I'm in the flow, that's when I'm at my happiest and healthiest. And that requires that balance of confidence and skill. And um, so when those combine and unite and time sort of stands still, you know you're on the right path and you know you're just where you um, are meant to be. And so that for me is a sign that I'm moving in the right direction. Oh, I like that. Never thought of it that way. That's why I love asking this question. You get so many different perspectives. Dominique, what do you think? Yeah, I, I think a happy, healthy human is multifaceted, right? There's there's the physical health, there's the mental health. And I think when, when things are in alignment and we've got the relationship support, which human to human relationship is so critical, especially after the last year and a half that we've been through, I think that that is a huge component of, of a happy, healthy human. And when all those things are in alignment, then that's when we're at our best. And um, it's been it's, it's definitely something that we need right now. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Being in alignment. I think that's a, that's a good point to, uh, to end on right here. Thank you so much to the three of you. It's been enlightening and always a wonderful conversation. Karen, Becky, Dominique, uh, that was the best 45 minutes. I appreciate all of you. And uh, thank you. Thank you for being here with us at the symposium. And I am so excited for what's to come. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.